Welcome to Bloom, um, Peter and Jing. This is um, maybe the hardest and most important conversation that we're going to be having today. Um, I think everybody in this room and people who have been working on biodiversity for the past year have heard how important it is um, to be working alongside and with indigenous peoples around the world. Um, but many people haven't really understood yet how to do that. And so that's really what I want to dive into with both of you today. Um, and so Peter, I want to start with you because you, you founded Conservation International. You've been working in this space for a really long time. You built this amazing, huge organization and then you decided to found another organization, Niatero, um, to work more closely or be more focused on work with indigenous people. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and why you decided to do that? Sure, thank you first, and congratulations to all of you who are devoting your life to finding answers and solutions. Um, you know, I started out as a wildlife ecologist working on grizzly bears in Wyoming and uh, ended up uh, starting Conservation International in 1987. Uh, along the pathway, uh, I worked on a lot of projects, uh, just kind of singularly focused on protection of territory. And then uh, I met an extraordinary woman by the name of Vicky Corpuz. Uh, and Vicky Corpuz was the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Rights. And we had a pretty profound and important conversation uh, and then had a series of panel discussions about the role that the conservation movement had played um, in pushing indigenous peoples off of territory. And, uh, and it happened that, uh, that uh, when I decided after 30 years to step down as the CEO of, uh, of Conservation International, um, I asked a group of people to map out where on the planet Earth were the territories of indigenous peoples. And there was a paper done by a fellow named Garnett, and I'm not certain if that slide is up now uh, or not, but... Um, it's up now. Uh, okay, uh, but, but this was a, a, a paper done in 2018 that basically said, and this is not accurate, by the way, this is grossly inaccurate, but it's notional, um, that, that about a third or maybe a little more of the planet's terrestrial territory, this is not, does not include the ocean territory, is under the guardianship of indigenous peoples still after five centuries of colonization. And so um, I asked the question, well, what's on that territory? And it was estimated that um, it was a significant, maybe 25% of the carbon. Uh, it was uh, uh, half of the forest. Uh, it was uh, the estimates on biodiversity are weak, but maybe 40% of biological diversity. Um, and, and I asked, so what's being done to support that effort? And the answer was not too much. It basically was a battleground for 5,000 tribal peoples, about a 250 million people, um, uh, indigenous peoples, trying to retain their territory. And so I went, to Vicky, I went to Vicky Corpuz and I said, let's go, Vicky. Why don't we create a new organization? Let's create a board that's predominantly indigenous. Let's build a staff that is both indigenous and non-indigenous, and let's just focus on what has to be done for the security of those cultures, their wisdom, and their territories. Mm -hmm. And that was six years ago, and um, um, that's how we got it started. Um, yeah. It's really an effort to learn about a different perspective on the planet, a different relationship, a reciprocal relationship with species and with all other beings. Um, and it's been, for me, it's been a remarkable uh, learning experience as I transition into an elder, because that's where I've gotten. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for, for doing that work and like being such a, um, a prominent ally in this space. Yeah. Can I just add, if you look at the next slide, yes. just to give a sense of scale. Another one. This shows this the northern Amazon. This is 68 million hectares of territory. And if you look at the next slide, the, the territory in the lower this is a Javari Valley. This is one territory in the Brazilian Amazon, in the northern Amazon. It borders with Peru and Colombia. Fifteen uncompacted tribal peoples are there. Uh, it uh, has 11 gigatons of above-ground carbon within its territory. It's larger 
than the territory of Austria, Portugal, the Philippines. I mean, this, these are massive opportunities. Combined or separately? Individually, individually. individually. Yeah. So this is the opportunity that we have to actually um, change how we behave and how the developed world relates to the rest of the world. Yeah, okay. So Jing, what is the challenge uh, <laughs> in, in doing that? Do you spend most of your time working on policy, advocating at the United Nations and in front of other global governance bodies for the rights of indigenous peoples? And you've seen growing up your mother doing that same work as well, Vicky Corpus, who Peter just talked about. Um, how far have we come and where do we need to go next? These kinds of things that Peter um, presented on the screen, these are the things that need to be protected. And a lot of the protection, the efforts for protection happen at the local level, rightly so. It's indigenous peoples just um, doing everything that they can to protect their territories. But I think it's also important that at the global level, at the United Nations, there are also efforts to make sure that there are protections at the global level so that we make sure that uh, areas like this on the screen continue to be pristine and uh, governed by indigenous peoples. The indigenous peoples have come to the, um, the United Nations, have engaged with the United Nations since the turn of the last century. In the 1920s, you've had indigenous leaders from, um, from New Zealand and from Canada already approaching the UN, even before it was called the UN. And most of it was about protection of rights. Our territories are in danger of being taken by others. And we would like to be able to maintain our control, our governance over the territory. And please um, provide us with the tools at the global level to, to protect. Um, but um, you, you asked about the, how it has changed, how the debates have changed, and how the demands of indigenous peoples have changed over the years. And it's completely related to what was shown on the screen. Um, in 2014, the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, you know, the, the, um, the, oh, sorry, 2018, the current strategic plan was about to expire in 2020, and they wanted a strategy for how to move forward, how to continue to protect habitats and so forth from 2020 onwards. And so a, a process was established. And there were so many scientific studies that came out, including the map of Garnett, um, so that uh, the world could see where we are in this effort to protect biological diversity. What they found is that we're not doing a good job. However, there are these pockets of territory occupied by indigenous peoples that are areas of uh, nature in a sea of degradation. So although nature is declining everywhere, including in indigenous territories, in indigenous territories, it's declining at a much, much lower rate. And therefore, the conclusion there was that it's important for indigenous peoples to be full partners in protection instead of you know, just thinking about um, indigenous peoples within a safeguards context. So for example, if there are uh, protected areas that need to be established over indigenous territories, or if there are companies that want to operate within indigenous territories, it's no longer just sufficient to, to have um, indigenous peoples as a uh, tick, you know, in a checklist, a uh, uh, checkbox. Um, and it's no longer just sufficient you know, to, to ask and say, okay, um, we are allowed to do so and so. It's more powerful, as shown by the scientific studies, for there to be full partnership with indigenous peoples and to trust our long-term presence, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, in the territory, living closely with nature, and to, you know, to trust that we know what we're doing, as Reno said earlier, and as um, the Ohlone sisters um, mentioned when they talked about their worldview. Yeah. So. Thank you for outlining that. Peter, you've been trying um, and successfully trying to build those partnerships over the past six years with Neotero. Mm -hmm. What have you learned and what lessons would you like to um, offer to the people in the audience today? Well, first of all, we have, we, have, we have partnerships with over 300 different tribal communities right now. And their territory is about 300 million acres right now. So it's accelerating and the opportunities are accelerating. 
Uh, and, and I just want to point out that if we think about scaled responses to a climate crisis or biodiversity crisis, when you have 5,000 peoples that are saying, we want to protect our territories, support us, that's a massive scale opportunity. And that's what we saw. And that's why we created Neoterra, was how do we do this? So the, the, you know, the key thing has been um, trust. The key thing has been, you know, we normally in the Western approach is we want to sign a contract and get our lawyers working on it. Um, and that is a different language than the language of relating and working with indigenous peoples. And so we started out by saying, we're going to learn how to trust. We're going to learn how to give up control and actually recognize that these communities, these peoples are totally dedicated to the security of their culture and their territories and their peoples and their language. And that's motivation. So it was trust. Mm -hmm. It was then thinking about how do we actually get uh, non-indigenous organizations and peoples to recognize what's in it for them. And, and the key thing, number one, is you can succeed in protecting biological diversity and climate. You can address social justice issues. You can protect your supply chains that we heard about earlier. I mean, when we talk about massive sources of fresh of fish, ocean territories, those are within the territories of indigenous nations. So it's supply chain. It's trust. When we think about how do we do that, the amount of financial resources is so uh, reasonable and the impact of having these committed communities that are fighting to protect it, it just seemed like um, the lessons were these can succeed big time and they can accelerate. And we're seeing the acceleration all across this planet. We are besieged with opportunities. And, and I think that that's really what I would suggest. I mean, in California alone, there's a major restoration initiative on the Klamath River right now to restore salmon, take down the dams. The Karuk people who are working on this, they need that kind of support. So for companies based in California, think local, find the right partners, give them the support that they need so that they can achieve what is good for all of us. Yeah. And where do big multinational companies come in here because there is also a good level of tension there between exploitation that has happened for, for many years and now companies are interested in building different relationships and partnerships. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, um, I was talking a little bit earlier about the, the new global biodiversity framework, which was touched on by Elizabeth in one of the earlier sessions. Yeah. And I think one of the breakthroughs in that um, framework is that, as I said, now indigenous peoples are front and center. 25% of the targets mention indigenous peoples and our rights specifically, uh, first in national spatial planning, determining how to use the land of the, the total land mass of a country. And it says that it's important to recognize that indigenous peoples have their own ways of uh, governing their lands and that should be taken into account. Then you have target three around conservation and recognizing that indigenous territories and so forth are important. And then you have a, a, a target that deals with uh, nature-related disclosures. Mm -hmm. So it's important for companies now to identify how they are dependent on nature and how they impact nature. And I think it's also important to look beyond na just nature, but also the stewards of nature and how indigenous peoples have been uh, caring for the land. So I think there is something in place at the global level now that's being cascaded down. And um, no, it's inevitable for, indig uh, for companies now, um, if they're required to, to identify their dependencies on, and impacts, it's inevitable that they would have to engage with indigenous peoples. And you know, there are many groups that can provide guidance on how to engage correctly with indigenous peoples. As Reno said earlier, you don't have to have someone who's an expert in uh, speaking with tribes, you just have to know the people. And you know, at Niatero, we've developed a database of uh, indigenous organizations that, you know, that, uh, that can relate, that have the capacity to relate with, uh, with companies. We are also pushing for uh, indigenous peoples to be part of boards, uh, initially of uh, conservation organizations, but I think corporations as well, maybe part of the staff, part of the boards, just so there is uh, knowledge about how to engage with indigenous peoples as full partners. Yeah. Maybe, mm. uh, yeah, um, over to you. I'm also thinking about like 
So, so I think those are great pathways. And then the funding and finance is another pathway, and that might be through philanthropic efforts um, that businesses and financial institutions are undertaking, or it might be through like the emerging biodiversity credit markets, nature-based solutions, credits, which is like a really quickly growing space. Um, do you feel like that has promise, or are you mostly worried about um, funding that will come through nature markets? I think that from there are a couple of responses. First, relating to the role and the reason that companies need to be thinking about this is your consumers, your future consumers are young people, and young people are thinking about these issues deeply. It's a social justice issue, and that's their power of how, what they buy. So it's, it's enlightened self-interest for a company to be engaged with this. There are a whole range of different financing you know, opportunities. Philanthropy is really important. Um, corporate uh, finance is truly important. There's an opportunity on markets. It's biodiversity sources, it's biodiversity credits, water credits, carbon credits. It has to be done really carefully. And I would just emphasize to everybody that's here that when you jump into these types of markets, you have to be assured and certain that there is an equitable distribution of the resources and that there's free, prior, and informed consent, that the peoples that are affected actually have the opportunity to say no if they want to say no. Yeah. And without that, if we do not do that, we're continuing this process of taking. And, and that's my real concern. My real concern is that in our eagerness to protect so much of the earth, that we do not stop and think that there are peoples that have done this for a long time that have to be listened to and have to be not only respected, but actually if we're smart, we will follow them. And that's hard to do because that's not what we normally do. So, so I would emphasize this, it's essential. We were in the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago with several, environment, several indigenous leaders and an extraordinary person named Yo-Yo Ma. And he's on our board of directors. Yeah. And tomorrow you're going to hear from another one of our board of directors, uh, Joe Williams, who's Maori, who chairs our board and is a Supreme Court justice. In that conversation, one of the indigenous leaders was asked a question, what do you want from us by these corporate leaders? His response, he's a man from the Solomon Islands, was he said, just trust us. And then what Yo-Yo Ma did was he took his cello and said, my cello was 200 years old. It's made from wood from three different continents. I sleep with my cello. And with that, he picked up his cello and he handed it to a young woman next to him. He said, please pass my cello around this room so everybody holds her. That cello passed around the entire room. And when he finished, he said, that's what trust is all about. And I think that that's the gap between where we are and where we have to get to. And I would really encourage all of you, do what Jane just said. Find indigenous peoples, engage them in your companies, put them on your boards of directors. Not a single one, but multiples. All right. I think we will take this as a great closing call to action. Thank you so much for being here, Peter and Jing. Um, we will have time over lunch today for a Q&A with Peter and Jing in room 230C, all the way on that side of the convention center. So please come and ask them questions, get advice, take advantage that these global leaders are here in person. Um, and later today, uh, Earthworm Foundation is also doing a film screening um, of um, a film that the Taike Dana Nation from Canada has put together, so we will have more indigenous elders here to share um, advice and perspective as well, so engage. Um, May I say one more thing, one second? Yes. The greatest gift that Vicky Corpuz, the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Leadership, ever gave to me was introduce me to her daughter, who's one of the great indigenous leaders at a global level. Yes. Jane Thank Corpuz. you, Jane. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.